From Square Two, this is What's Wrong With Revenue. I'm Mike Lieberman, CEO at Square Two, and along with my longtime friend, Eric Kalis, and co-founder at Square Two and six-time entrepreneur, Eric and I will answer the question CEOs have every single day, what's wrong with revenue? You can be part of the live cast show where we'll answer your questions every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern, or catch the show on demand on YouTube and on all your favorite podcast networks. Also check out all our audio and video content on Square2 Plus at the square2marketing.com website. Enjoy the show. Welcome to What's Wrong with Revenue. I am Mike Lieberman, CEO and Chief Revenue Scientist at Square2, and I'm joined with my longtime friend and business partner, co-founder of Square2, Eric Kalis. Eric, say hi to everybody. Hello to everybody. Thanks for joining. So I'm thrilled to be doing this. This is long in production for Eric and me and the rest of the team at Square2. This is actually our third attempt at a video slash podcast slash livecast. And we're really excited not only to be doing the show with everybody today, but also to be hopefully setting a little bit of an example about how you guys could potentially do some content at scale as well. So let me go back a little bit and tell you a little story about how we came up with the idea, because I think it's important. Eric and I do a lot of public speaking. We talk to a lot of CEOs. Uh, Eric speaks at Vistage. We, we talk to a lot of companies who present themselves to Square Two to see if we can help them. And we've also studied this idea of the challenges associated with growing companies and driving revenue results month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year. HubSpot published something a few years ago that said roughly 23% of businesses uh, are able to hit their quarterly revenue goals. Salesforce published something that said something like 43% of companies are able to hit their revenue goals. When Eric and I go and talk to CEOs, we ask them to tell us, how are you doing hitting your revenue goals? And the, the results are actually worse. It's usually one out of 10 CEOs are comfortable admitting that, yes, we got it locked down every month, every quarter, we're able to hit our revenue goals. So Eric and I started talking, and it seems like there's a question in the marketplace. What's wrong with revenue? It seems like a question CEOs are asking. Why can we not hit our revenue goals? So when Eric started and I started talking about this, it seemed like a good idea to see if we could share some information on what it takes to consistently drive revenue. Now, as a good business partner, Eric said to me, well, what are we going to talk about? How is this going to be a show? And literally in About 10 or 15 minutes, we sat down and came up with 26 things that contribute to companies struggling to hit revenue. Well, that's six months worth of show topics. So we're good to go on the show. We're well planned out. Uh, We we are hopefully going to drive an interesting format here. So this is a live cast. We have people joining us. We have 13 people who are with us uh, on the show today. This is not going to be a presentation by Eric and Mike. It's going to be a conversation. We would like you to ask us questions along the way about things that are challenging you from a revenue growth, revenue generation perspective. In fact, I'm gonna start the show by saying, why don't you guys who are joining us tell us what is your biggest challenge as it relates to driving revenue? And we will keep track of, uh, use the Q&A, please, the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom. If you put your, um, your, your particular challenge in there, we'll pick it up and we will try to answer it. We may do some live Q&A as well, depending on how we're doing with timing. So we're going to go to around five o'clock. If we're in the middle of an interesting topic, we might go a little bit longer, but we're planning about to be with you guys for about an hour. We're thrilled to have you here. Like I said, we're live casting today. We're going to live cast every Wednesday at four o'clock. So you can always hop on and talk to us about your revenue challenges. We are recording this and it will be published to our YouTube channel as a TV show, a, a webcast show. We are also recording this for podcasting purposes. So we're going to be producing a new podcast. What's wrong with revenue that will be on the on the most all of the most popular podcast networks. So if you're into podcasts, you'll be able to get it there too. And all of this audio and video content is also going to be on the Square2 Marketing website in a special place that we'll talk about in a couple of weeks. But as I mentioned, 
in an hour, Eric and I are going to produce a podcast, a video cast, a live cast, and content for our website. So when you talk about content at scale, I hope you can see that this is a new model that a lot of companies are adopting that we are working with our clients on and we're going to basically uh, share with you today. So Eric, what's wrong with revenue? It's a problem we hear about constantly when we're talking to companies. You do a lot of, uh, you, you have a lot of conversations with potential prospects at Square Two. So let's talk a little bit about the first issue. Most companies we talk to have no comprehensive strategy across the company. And we talk a lot about strategy before tactics, but what do you think is needed to, to, to produce the kind of strategy that a company might be missing so that their revenue does perform? Well, Mike, if I gave you all the ingredients for a chocolate cake, but I do not give you the recipe, how is that cake gonna turn out? Not so good. But if I give you all the recipe, sorry, if I give you all the ingredients and the recipe, even if you don't know how to cook, you follow the recipe, you get a pretty tasty cake. In my 19 years of working with entrepreneurial companies, CEOs specifically, that are looking to grow their companies to the next level, the common thread is no strategy, no recipe to bake the cake. So what do I mean by strategy? If I ask a business owner, why should I do business with you? That requires a knock your socks off answer in return. The problem I have seen over and over again is that companies really don't stand in the shoes of their prospective and current clients and ask themselves, what do these folks need? What do they wanna hear? What information do they need to feel safe? What questions do they need answers? And I think strategically, if a lot of companies would flip-flop their conversation from talking about themselves to answering those questions and concerns of their prospects by standing in their shoes, a lot of things would run a lot more smoothly. And I think that that is, at the highest level, the biggest symptom that people don't take the time to do the strategy. And Mike, you know as well as I do, we get this call at our office every single week. Hey, can you guys build us a new website? We sure can. What would you like it to say? And then there's crickets, because nobody thinks about the big story, making an emotional connection, differentiating themselves with their competition. They just want to have the fancy new website up on the internet. And that is the biggest uh, mistake. I can't tell you how many times I'm on a prospect call where someone says, hey, let me show you my new website. And I'm like, oh, well, who did your website? A website design firm. Oh, that's great. How much time did they spend with you on the strategy before they started building the site? Oh, no, they just asked us which websites we liked and what we wanted and how many pages, and they started building. And I think right there is the crucial problem that most companies face. Does that make sense, Mike? I think it makes perfect sense. So let's drill down on that a little bit. And we actually have an example that we can show when we're done this, this first part of the conversation. And by the way, if anyone has any questions while we're talking, just put it in the Q&A and we will try to get to them. Remember, I, we wanna really have a conversation with you guys as opposed to just you listening to Eric and, and me talk. But Eric's right. So when it comes to revenue, there's really three parts of the company that typically generate revenue, right? Marketing is responsible for introducing the company to people that might not know about you. It's responsible for generating prospects. It's responsible for feeding the sales team. The sales team is then responsible for turning those opportunities into new customers. And then the customer service team is responsible for taking really good care of those customers. So they keep being customers and maybe they even buy additional services or, or even better, tell their friends about your company, uh, advocate for your company online. Like there's so many things that we will talk about when we get to the customer piece of it. But if we're breaking down the strategy failures, it re they really do fall under these three buckets. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the marketing piece of it. Eric's gonna talk a little bit about the sales piece of it, and then we will tag team on the customer service side of things. So what typically is missing from a marketing perspective, in addition to what Eric talked about, is a lot of the companies we talk to aren't exactly sure who they're trying to attract. They might have some idea but they need to have a very focused and the more narrow they can be, the better off they'll be, right? 
Um, like Eric likes to say, if I could sell mozzarella cheese to pizza shops, that would be super easy. Every pizza shop needs mozzarella cheese, off you go. But most of you guys don't have businesses like that. If you try to be everything to everybody, you're gonna be nothing to, to no one. So you have to really identify who you're trying to talk to. A lot of people refer to this as personas. Developing personas is almost always something that companies think they have, and a lot of them do. It's the most common component of strategy that we see, a lot of people have personas. But when we dig into those personas, lots of times they're incomplete or maybe too general or too broad or, or not specific in detail around how these people actually purchase from you. So that's the first kind of marketing tip around strategies. You really need to know who you want to attract to your business. The next thing, and this is, Eric talked about this a little bit, you really need to know what problems, we call them pains, but what problems these people are having and how you solve those pains and then how you do it in a way that no one else can do. And some people refer to that as differentiation. We refer to that as what makes you remarkable because in our mind, there's a difference between differentiation and, and being remarkable. So when we work with clients, we talk to them and ask them, well, what makes you special? And a lot of them will say things like, our people are great. Um, our, uh, you know, our product is great. You know, we've been around for 30 years. And our comment to them is, well, those are all really good, but are they really remarkable? Someone choosing you because you've been around for 30 years. If your competitor has been around for 20 years and you've been around for 30 years, it's it's better. But it, you know, it might someone might not care about the 10 extra years. In terms of your people, it's very rare that we find companies saying, well our people are kind of mediocre. You probably shouldn't hire us. They don't say that. They say their people are great. Everyone says their people are great. So when you say it, it, it doesn't resonate. It's not special. So you have to really find those things about your business that are special. And here's some good news. When we work with clients, they almost always have things that are special, but often they are not talking about those things. Those things are not front and center in their marketing. Eric, you had a really interesting conversation with me earlier today about a jeweler who was doing amazing things, but it really didn't come out in their marketing. Is that right? That is exactly right. Once again, they had the most beautiful website. It was targeted to men who wanted to buy customized jewelry for their significant other. So that's a very sound strategy. Men sometimes aren't so good at picking out gifts. This is a great way to buy something custom that doesn't cost too much money. I'm like, oh, they filled a nice hole in the market. But yet when you went to their website, the first thing you saw was a gorgeous pair of earrings. So I asked the entrepreneur, well, how do I customize these earrings? They go, oh, well, those actually aren't customizable. But I said, but you told me that it was customizable jewelry under $100. So right off the bat, they wanted to have a beautiful photograph of uh, earrings that didn't fit their market, or at least their promise. The other part was that they were featuring on their homepage their new bridal shop, where the bride could get customizable gifts for the bridesmaids. Great. But once again, they had uh, indicated that the target market was a male looking to buy customizable gifts at a reasonable price. Now, what was interesting about that is that the entrepreneur was a little bit surprised. They didn't think that that was what was going on. But when you put it in simple terms like, hey, you said you were doing this, but this is what it shows here. Once again, the strategy got all muddled because now... A, a, a man who goes to the website to buy for his uh, uh, significant other now is confused because there's a bridal shop and he might leave. And then I don't want to get too nerdy on the marketing, but we know that's happening because bounce rate would go up, right? How many people come to your homepage and leave without going inside? Time on site would be just a few seconds. Pages viewed would be one. These are the metrics that we can use to analyze whether the strategy is working or not. So, you know, that was one thing. And then strategically, I asked some more questions about the website, like, well, how many people come to this website each month? And I had quickly said, maybe, uh, you know, a thousand a day. And they go, ha, 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 a thousand a day. We get 10,000 a day. I'm like, that's amazing. 
but there were no conversion points. And for the CEOs in the audience today, you don't just want website visitors, you wanna convert those website visitors into your database so you can continue a conversation with them. Well, when there's no conversion opportunities, and I suggested a free report like, hey men, six great gifts to get your special person under $100, every person who's having trouble picking a gift would wanna download that and maybe even give their email address in exchange for that. And now at the end of the year, you have 100,000 people in your database that you could use to drip on and reach out to. And every time you hit that database, you're gonna generate some revenue. So once again, that was a problem with revenue. If we don't have a database, we can't talk to those people. Once again, a symptom of not being strategic, but being tactical. Yeah, that was a great explanation of where that breakdown is there. So if Wait we a know minute. Who I'm sorry, Mike, how much does it cost to post a free report on your website? Not very much. Compared to advertising, which this company Way was less. engaged in, right? They were engaged Way in a lot less. of advertising and all those advertising dollars that were spent to drive people to those websites. So we're not talking about spending a boatload on advertising to drive revenue. We're talking about being smarter, creative, and very strategic about how we approach you know, driving that revenue. Right, so once we know who we're talking to and what their pains and challenges are and what makes us special, we now have a very compelling story. And that story becomes front and center for your marketing. It's included on your website, like Eric was talking about. It's included in email campaigns. And the next part of this strategy piece is the tactics, which honestly, everyone more or less knows what kind of tactics to execute. You might not know in what sequence or in what combination, but everyone knows they need a great website. Everyone knows they need to email their customers and prospects. Everybody knows they need to have educational content to inform people to make a solid purchase decision. You know you need social media and, and all those things. So, you know, in terms of what tactics you need, they fall in line very quickly when you have a solid strategy because you know how to get in touch with the people you want to talk to. There are a couple more elements of the marketing strategy and then I'm going to let Eric talk about the sales strategy, but there's a budget and an expectations perspective here too that, that gets handled with strategy. So if you are expecting a thousand leads a month from your marketing activities and you're only planning on investing a thousand dollars a month and right now you have zero leads, it's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. There's a direct correlation to what you need the business to produce and the investment you put into it. So if you're thinking about, well, what should I be investing in marketing and how much should I be spending and is it enough and is it, is it not enough? It's all dependent on what you wanna get out of it. If you're getting 10 leads a month now and you wanna get 12 leads a month next month, well then that might not require a massive investment. But if you're getting 10 leads a month now and you wanna get 100 leads next month, you can be sure that 10 x in your lead generation is gonna require a significant investment. How much, I'm not exactly sure, but I want everyone to understand as you're thinking through the strategy piece of this, you have to have enough plan to invest to produce the kind of leads you want to deliver. Now, if you're talking to an agency like ours and we give you an idea of how much it's gonna to take to, to generate the, the massive amount of leads, you might say to yourself, well, Maybe I can deal with a little bit less out of the gate, which is fine. We can then reduce the investment. It's directly proportional to what you want to get out of it. So you have to have a solid story. You have to know who you're talking to. You have to have the tactics in place to deliver that story. And you have to have the right level of investment behind your marketing to produce the kind of results you're expecting. So that that is the base, the bare bones foundation associated with the strategy component to the marketing piece of it. And I want Eric to talk a little bit about the strategy that goes into the sales side of it, because if we generate leads, we still need the salespeople to pick them up and turn them into customers. So Eric, hit it. Well, I think the first thing is, let me bridge what you said, Mike, to the sales side of that, right? So one of the mistakes that we see most is that people have a pretty decent experience in the marketing, right? The marketing journey. And then they say, wow, I kind of like this company and what they have to say. So they raise their hand by filling out a form, chatting, dropping an email and saying, I'd like to talk to someone about perhaps working together. What happens is that great story, the experience I had on the website, the content that I consumed often does not match the experience they get with a salesperson. 
And that's a symptom of not having a good continuing sales strategy. If I know that people are having certain challenges and my company has the solutions to those challenges, I wanna make sure that I have a seamless, frictionless experience for my buyers. And that includes the salespeople because a lot of people say, well, once it becomes a sales opportunity, oh, it goes into a different department. And if you read Mike in my book, second book called uh, Fire Your Sales Team Today, we actually talk a lot about smashing the sales and the marketing teams together into a revenue department so that everybody's kind of pulling on the rope in the same direction, always looking to hit those numbers we need to grow the company. So that's the number one thing is that we have a breakdown between the marketing experience and the sales experience. But from a sales perspective, lots of companies don't have a sales process. So what do I mean by sales process? A sales process is a orchestrated and choreographed experience that your salespeople take a prospect through. Now, Mike and I, we're big fans of a process that we created several years ago called the five D's. And it's a simple example of a good sales process. The first D is discovery, have a little call, see if it's a fit. The second D is diagnostic. If we decide together that it's a fit, let's ask lots of questions so we could co-create a final solution together. Once that you, your team has that information, they can go to the third D, which is design. Design a program, an engagement, a piece of machinery that matches what the client's goals and objectives are. Then deliver it with their approval. Now, approvals become a lot easier when you co-create a solution because everybody's collaborating and the, uh, the uh, solution was developed by everybody at the table. And the fifth D, we laughingly say, is delight because when you're all done and you get delivered above and beyond the expectations of what you bought, you delight, you tell your buddies, and that's where we get the referrals and word of mouth. Now, that might seem a little simple, but by, by having a 5Ds process, as I've described, all salespeople now follow the same process. Everybody has the same experience. We've pre-written emails that follow up on those stages that are in the perfect voice and tone of the company. And you, as the CEO, can now make sure that they're getting that same story told to them via the salespeople. We know the old story. If you take 10 salespeople and put each one of them in a different room and ask them about the company, you get 10 different stories. But by having a orchestrated and choreographed sales process, now we know exactly what's being presented to the prospect. Now, I have used the word friction as well. Lots of times there's friction in a sales process and that makes people scared and they go away. A good sales process thinks about how can we remove obstacles that prospects have when buying from us, right? No, you don't have to fill out uh, a 20 page form in order to have a discovery call. Let's just jump right on and, and get right into it. Nothing to prepare, we'll take care of that. Or your agreement should not be 83 pages that requires legal review. It should be simple, written in plain English so people know what they're signing up for and now they can move forward with the engagement. So once again, at the highest level, choreographed and orchestrated sales process that matches the marketing experience that people have and removing any friction that you can identify will go a long way for driving revenue. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. We've seen this produce shorter sales cycles. We've seen it produce higher close rates. And to give you a, a very practical example, I'm sure most of you deal with the request for references fairly regularly. And typically what people do is, well, let me get in touch with my customers. Let me see if they're available. Let me see if they're, they want to do the reference call. Okay, they'll do it. Then you put your, your customer and your prospect together, and now they have to coordinate schedules and a couple of weeks go by before they get to talk. Well, one example of this process that Eric's talking about is putting together a reference reel and sharing that video reference reel with prospects right before they ask for references and letting them know that, look, these are probably some of the people that you're gonna end up talking to. Here they are, they're talking about their experience with, with this particular company. And you may in fact remove all effort to generate the, the referral call, the, re the reference call. So uh, that's- I'm sorry to interrupt, but anybody who drops their email in the chat, I'll send you the template that we use for that specific email and you can experience that reference reel and how we put it together. Um, but Mike, how much does it cost to put together that reference reel? Not much. <laughs> and how many times do we actually get asked for references? About half the time we used to before we had it. 
That's exactly right. So it cut it all out, removed some friction there, sped up the sales process, and we didn't spend a lot of money piecing that reference reel together. Right. So we talked about marketing. We talked about sales. Let's talk briefly about service, customer service, because there's a ton of revenue opportunities in customer service. And it's rarely uh, taken advantage of. In fact, uh, most of our clients who come to us are talking about marketing and generating leads and sales and getting sales to be better. And we ask them, well, how, what kind of marketing do you do? And what kind of outreach and communication do you do with your customers? It's generally, well, not much. And we found tremendous op revenue opportunities buried in our clients' customer base. So I think you have to consider having the same kinds of ongoing conversations like we talked about in marketing and sales with your customers and marketing to them regularly too, not with the idea of offering the promotions or discounts or talking about new products, but sharing the same kind of stories you would share with a prospect with a customer. Most customers don't buy everything a, a company provides. They buy one or two things, the things that they needed initially. Companies rarely get back around to talking to them about the other things that they could potentially buy. And there's a tremendous opportunity with a little bit of outreach and organized um, marketing to customers to drive revenue. We had a, a, a distributor of John Deere products and one of their objectives was to have a better uh, re more revenue producing relationship with their customers. And with some simple email campaigns, we were able to uh, talk to people who bought equipment about maintenance services and getting them back into the store for, for more ongoing maintenance, to talk about add-on products, getting them back in the store to buy add-on products. And it's the kind of marketing that is rarely used, but almost always drives revenue. The other example is Today, the way people buy, they're looking for your client's online commentary. They're looking for reviews about your business. They look, they're, looking, they're asking questions online from people that all, are already your customers. And you have to activate your customers and turn them into advocates. You have to get them to write reviews. You have to get them to go on video and talk about their experience. So actively working with customers to provide those kinds of assets are also going to fuel your ability to drive revenue. So you're gonna need a solid strategy there too. You're gonna to need to know how to connect with these people. You're gonna to need to have your customers segmented by the products they bought. You're gonna to need to come up with some uh, type of outreach, email marketing, uh, messaging strategy to stay in touch with customers even after they buy. And by doing that and thinking through that a little bit, you already know what story to tell them. You already know they like you. These people have chosen you already. It's a much easier sell it becomes a very steady revenue stream that can support your revenue objectives as well. So we have to make sure we have a strategy for marketing sales and customer service. So that's one of our big takeaways today. Hopefully we spend enough time going into that. Um, I wanna shift gears a little bit and, and because this might seem to some of you like a monumental task. Wow, you guys are all over the place and you're talking about some big things that we're maybe not so great at at our company or we haven't done in a while or we thought were okay. And, now, maybe after hearing you, we realize we need to pay some attention to it. Where do we start? If we want to tackle this strategy challenge, where's the best place to start? Eric, do you have any suggestions for, for our listeners here? Well, strategy before tactics. So the first thing that I would do is I would sit down with my leadership team and I would start to talk about the strategy behind what we're going to do. What I mean by that is a couple of simple questions answered. Who's our perfect client? What pains and problems do they have? How do we solve those problems? And how can we do it in a really remarkable fashion? Those four questions are typically the genesis of a really good messaging package. If your team could spend an hour hashing that out and then maybe coming back after they've thought about it and fine tuning it a bit, all of a sudden good things will happen. That's my uh, typical starting point. The other place that I think you want to uh, consider is the buyer journey, right? So we actually have a buyer journey model that has eight different stages to it. We call it the cyclonic buyer journey. We wrote about it in our third book, Smash the Funnel. But that's, if you want to think about that as a map, it's a wonderful map for any company to start thinking about what are our prospects going through when they're interacting with our marketing materials? What are our prospects going through when they're interacting with our salespeople? What are our customers going through when they're interacting with our customer service team? 
And by mapping out all of those experiences, we typically call those touch points. There are many touch points across this buyer journey. If there are eight stages in the buyer journey, there could be a hundred different touch points. Even the way you um, bill the customer is a touch point. Um, the, 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 the packing materials in the stuff that you could be shipping to them is a touch point. All of that is, all of those are touch points. When they land on your website, it's a touch point. When they first talk to sales, it's a touch point. When sales interacts with them, like Eric said, sending emails is a touch point. Like you have to understand where all those touches are. Once that you have that inventory of touches, you can start to go through them and adjust them to provide a much better experience and to educate your prospects better and to support customer service with maybe an email campaign or help sales with a video at the right exact time based on what people are typically asking in the sales process. The buyer journey is almost always an amazing place to start. First of all, you know what your prospects experiences are because you've done this for so long. Your salespeople can tell you what questions they're asking when they're talking to sales. You might be able to derive what questions they're asking from a marketing perspective based on what searches they're doing um, and what questions they're coming to sales with very early in the sales process or what pages on your website they're clicking on. If people are clicking on your pricing page a lot, then you know they have questions about price. If they're clicking on the Our Team page, then you know they have questions about who you are and how long you've been around and who are they gonna be working with. So the buyer journey is a wonderful opportunity to start thinking about strategy in a way in which you'll be able to then leverage those conversations into some changes into the way you market, sell, and take care of your customers. Anything you want to add to that, Eric? No, that was very good. The buyer's journey is critical. Um, okay. Go ahead. No, go ahead. All you. I'm good. All right, great. <laughs> All right. So we talked a little bit in the lead up to this in some of our promotions about random acts of marketing. We hear a lot of people saying to us, it feels like we're doing random acts of marketing. Like we tried this, it didn't work. We tried that, it didn't work. You know, we, we hired this agency, it didn't work. And, and that kind of um, uncoordinated start stop feeling, if you're having that, might be what we call random acts of marketing. Now, random acts of marketing are a symptom of not having a strategy. So if you're feeling like your marketing is a little random or staccato, or you, know, you start and stop things without really letting it get any traction, it's because you don't have a strategy. If you take the time to put the strategy in place like we've been talking about, it almost always eliminates the feeling of random acts of marketing because you're running campaigns and you're executing tactics that align to your strategy. And you know going into it, your paid social campaign on Facebook is going to run for three months. It's targeting these individuals. It's promoting this piece of content. It's driving them back to this landing page. The offer is, is defined very clearly. You have a nurture set up for the offer that encourages them to connect with sales. You have chat on that landing page. If they're in a hurry to talk to sales, they can chat and set up a sales meeting immediately. Your sales team knows exactly what campaign they've come from. So they're contextually orienting their sales conversation and you can track how long it took someone from that very first ad being placed to the time that they signed your paperwork. That in and of itself, technically eliminates what we're calling random acts of marketing and gives you a much more comprehensive approach to how you're trying to engage with prospects and how you're trying to turn prospects into customers. Excellent. So let's talk about how we get everyone at all level of the company, all levels of the company on board, because we also hear this a lot. I am the marketing director and I need to go to my boss and my boss needs to go to their boss and we need to get everyone on the same page about this. I see the value in this, but I need to convince them also. We're actually currently talking to a prospect now where a chunk of the leadership team is bought, on, bought into this approach, but the CEO is still a little skeptical. So I'm gonna ask Eric, how do you think we, uh, the people listening should maybe go about getting everyone in the company aligned behind this. Because you know, if, if customer service isn't on board or if sales isn't on board, this strategy is not going to provide the experience we're looking for. You were actually telling me about 
a company you're working with now that is having a little trouble getting their sales organization on board. You want to tell that story? Uh, I do. Let me uh, lead up to it by saying that, you know, being an entrepreneurial company has a lot of moving parts and they all have to work together. The first thing is, and we touched upon this a little bit uh, more than the average uh, uh, topic today, which is the story, right? How are we telling the story of our company? That story is not just for prospects. That story is also for recruiting. When you are uh, hiring someone, you have to give your marketing message to them to make sure that they're buying into that right from the beginning. You want to make sure that it's a fit for the people that you hire. If you're looking to change the entire X industry, you got to make sure that the person you're hiring also is aligned with that. Like, oh, I would like to be involved in a company that's changing the world. Whether it's changing manufacturing or changing consulting or changing distribution, you have to make sure that it's a fit. Too often, we're hiring people independent of what our big mission is. Now, for the CEOs in the audience today, you know, there's strategic planning tools like EOS or Rockefeller Habits that are very popular. Before you even begin to do some of the more granular planning, you got to figure out your vision, your uh, big message or your big story, um, your uh, 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 purpose of why you do what you do. And those are pretty important. So I just wanted to make a little note that the marketing message, the big story that prospects might hear also work for prospective hires, right? Because if we're getting them early, that certainly helps adoption or buy-in of the message that we're going to send. Assuming that you have the right amount of people, now let's go into that story. So uh, it, it's a very successful company that has four different divisions. In the four different divisions, they have small groups of salespeople that sell the products in each one of those divisions. They are basically rogue. They do whatever they want, meaning that they keep their sales leads on spreadsheets. They uh, Maybe they don't keep them at all. They have one big client that they service and they don't hunt for new ones. They're really all over the place. Uh, true, uh, to give credit where credit's due, the CEO says, enough of this. We got to bring everybody together and we were going to implement a CRM. They've chosen HubSpot as their CRM. But the owner was very nervous that the sales folks would not buy in. She said, okay, well, let's talk about adoption, right? Let's talk about the things that we could do. Well, the easiest one to do is reward people for their good behavior, right? Hey, if someone uses the CRM five times in a row, here's a Starbucks gift card. We present it publicly to show that people are starting to buy in. Or you could use a little bit of more of the stick versus the carrot, right? From now on, we're only going to provide leads to our salespeople through the CRM. So if you want your leads, you got to go in there and get them that way. There's also some training that goes on. I want to feel comfortable with the tool that I'm using, right? So support me. Uh, you know, the old story about the husband and wife that get married and six months later, the wife says, you never say you love me anymore. He says, I told you at the altar, if anything changes, I'll let you know. Well, that doesn't work. We have to always be saying, I love you, which means we always have to be supporting our salespeople with training and new things that they can do. The other thing we want to do is we want to pick a tiger team, right? Get the uh, three young whippersnappers that really love working with the CRM and get them to kind of breathe in their experiences at sales meetings and things like that so that the people that are a bit more reticent are like, well, it's really not that hard. And then you want to make sure that uh, no matter what, at the end of the day, it's a safe place to make mistakes, right? Because when you're trying new things, whether it's rolling out a new marketing message or a new landing page on your website, we never know if it's going to work exactly the way we anticipated, but we want to be aggressive enough to try new things so that we could uh, have opportunities to beat the control. You know, uh, we're constantly encouraging our clients, hey, let's change the message on your homepage and let it sit for seven days and see if our results are better. That's uncomfortable to the client, but for us, there's no worries because we can always go back to the old way, but at least we're trying, we're getting ourselves out there. So in the case of the salespeople that are a bit reticent, give it a try. If it doesn't work, if you make a mistake, no problem. We're going to take the next 30 days and we're going to play with this thing until we all feel comfortable. So, you know, just by implementing a system of a, a buyer's journey, it's not enough. You got to bring in all your folks so that they support you. And it becomes a rallying cry that we're going to take our company to the next level. The end result, Mike, is you drive revenue because more exciting things are happening, more activity uh, in the salesperson example. Each one of them has more capacity now because they're using um, state-of-the-art tools to do automated follow-ups and sales sequences, and they can handle more opportunities, which makes the company more money and the salespeople make more money. So there's a lot of things that you can do that are around adoption that don't cost much, but really make people feel safe. 
Yeah, I can't emphasize enough the pilot concept you mentioned. I think in all three areas, running pilots or proof of concepts, if you will, are excellent ways to, in a very controllable way, show the rest of the company that things are working the way you expected them to. So, you know, without necessarily redoing your entire website, putting up a landing page and a piece of content on your current website, adding some videos into that, positioning it in a, in a, in a prominent place on the homepage and using that as an example of how we can potentially take our visitors, attract them with content, turn anonymous visitors into leads, nurture them, and at some point have them become sales opportunities is a very low cost way to show the rest of the company maybe a slightly different bent on how you want to execute your marketing strategy. And, Taking, low, risk, and low risk as well, Mike, right? Because very, very low effort, risk. Post some things, see what happens. If nobody downloads your stinking free report, all right, we'll go on to another plan later. But right. I mean, these are tried and true blocking and tackling that good companies use in order to build databases and connect with prospects. There's literally no risk. Right. Taking the, a small group of salespeople, look, getting salespeople to do anything different is generally fairly challenging. Taking a small group of progressive salespeople and saying like, hey, you guys are going to be our guinea pigs here or gals, you, you people are going to be our guinea pigs here. And we're going to introduce you to this new uh, tool and we're going to do things a little bit differently and we're going to keep track of it and report on it and 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 share with the company your progress two or three months down the road these people in the pilot are getting leads closing business hitting their revenue goals the rest of the sales team is going to want to be part of that going forward how how are they doing it what are you doing differently? Why didn't you invite me to be part of that? I want to be part of that. When are you going to re you know, release what they're doing to everybody else? It's a much different position than if you go to the entire sales team and say, hey, tomorrow, we're all doing things differently. You got to do it like this or you're out or you got to do it like this because I say so. It, it's just a whole different approach. And you could do the same thing with service. You know, let's put an email campaign focused on one customer service rep or two customer service reps uh, portfolio. Let's see if we can get customers to engage in conversations about new products or services. We don't have to market to the entire customer base. Let's just do a small pilot and see how it goes. Let's try a couple of different uh, uh, avenues to see if we can get those people engaged and see if we can get them to buy services or visit a particular page or call the rep back and have a conversation. There's so many things that can be done at a low risk level without disrupting the apple cart. I think many, many CEOs and many, many companies are afraid of doing things completely differently. What if it doesn't work? Like I, they're, they're afraid of that. And it's a legitimate concern because while you might not be hitting your revenue goals every quarter, you obviously have successful businesses, most of you. you you've been doing this for a long time, relatively long time. You know, you, you wanna be cautious about the moves you make, but that's the, what we're talking about do not have to be wholesale dramatic changes. They can be changes that are subtle, that can be proven, and once they're proven, can be expanded and rolled out to a broader group of people. So I think that's something, honestly, we don't talk about a lot, but I think are, are, are very good ideas for people to consider when they're looking at making some adjustments to marketing sales and customer service. Hey, Mike, I mean, now that we have all our uh, friends here on our first episode, right, why don't we open the kimono a little bit and talk about our accelerator program? You know, Kristen Stricker, who's our COO, was just fed up with customers saying, where are my results? Where are my results? And she innovated on her own a program where we can get six months worth of work done in 30 days. That's a little scary. That's totally new. Nobody else was doing it in the industry. So we got together a small tiger team of our employees and saying, hey, we're going to try this new thing to condense the delivery of our program. Who wants to be in? And a couple people volunteered. The first time we tried it, we got such great feedback from the client. The team members that were working on that accelerator program couldn't stop talking about the great experience they had. And other team members were like, how do I get in on one of these accelerators? Now, for Mike and me, we're like, well, nobody's ever tried this before. It feels a little risky, but hey, let's give it a shot. Now, two and a half years, Mike? How many years later? Three years, maybe? A little over two. 
But two and a half years later, 70% of our revenue comes from accelerator programs. But if we wouldn't take that little leap of faith that, hey, let's try something new and engage the team. You know what? There was no problem if the first one didn't work out or we couldn't figure out how to make clients happy, uh, you know, for that one client. But after a good success, we tried another and another. And now we have multiple accelerators running in a parallel fashion, changed our whole business. But once again, I think for the CEOs in the audience, trying a little new marketing strategy, trying a new sales strategy, right? Following up with existing clients to try to upsell them and cross sell them more. Those are the things you got to try if you want to drive revenue without spending a bowl load of money on advertising. Great. So in the last couple minutes we have here together, we wanted to talk a little bit about how do you know if your strategy is working? I mean, there are metrics associated with very specific things that we've been talking about today that Eric mentioned specifically around your website and sales and customer service, but how do you know your big strategy is working or not? And I think there are some quantitative ways to know for sure Obviously, if you're getting more sales opportunities and you're closing more business and you're closing it faster, those are kind of obvious ways to know whether your strategy is working or not. But sometimes those take a while to start to material materialize. For instance, if you have a long sales cycle and some of the clients we work with might have six month sales cycle or a year sales cycles, you're not going to know about some of those things for quite a ways down the road. So there are some other ways in which you'll know whether strategy is working. And a couple of those are, first, you'll start to notice that more people are spending more time on your website. So if your message is compelling, then they'll spend more time on your site. They'll click around more. They'll bounce less, like Eric said. You may also have people who are sharing qualitative commentary with the sales team. So this is where marketing and sales need to be very closely aligned. Like, and marketing needs to ask the salespeople, what are the prospects saying when you pick them up in their buyer journey? Well, I went to your website and it was amazing. Your message really spoke to me. I loved your videos. I, I clicked around reading your success stories. I really appreciated your resources section. Those are good qualitative indicators that your strategy is working, especially when they say, I went to your website and it really spoke to me. We were working with a relatively new client last week and we unveiled to them their new story and their new website. And I'm not lying. They literally shed a little tear. They, they had an emotional connection to the way we were able to capture their story and translate it into something that the prospect would emotionally connect with. So I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but the way people buy is they, we all, this is, this is universal, this is a human condition. We all buy emotionally first and then rationalize second. And what I mean by that is, and I'll use this very simple example. When you go to the furniture store and you see that sofa, the first thing you say is, well, I really like that sofa. I love that sofa. I could see that sofa in my living room. Like, those are emotional responses, right? Um, what happens next is rationalization. How much is it? What's the size? When can I get it? Are there shipping costs associated with delivering? You know, how long do I have to wait for it? So all of those feelings that we have as human beings, everyone goes through that. So your website has to emotionally connect with your prospects. And unfortunately, you have 10 seconds to do it. Google and Microsoft have both done research that says if you don't emotionally connect with your prospect on your website in 10 seconds, they're hitting the back button. And where are they going when they hit the back button? Where they're going back to Google where they see the list of competitors and they're going to your competitors. I guarantee you if they leave your homepage, they're gonna go look at your competitor's website. So you, you have a very narrow window and you have a very difficult task of trying to connect with them emotionally. Now, this circles back to our conversation about story. But since we're talking about how do we know if your strategy is working or not, if your prospects are telling your sales reps that your website spoke to them, your website was very compelling, your website made me think differently. You know, when I landed on your website, I just felt like I wanted to look around a little more. Those are also very good indicators that your strategy is working. 
then we can also talk about the amount of sales opportunities, again, because that's not necessarily closed sales. There, there are gonna be a lot of quantitative numbers that will also dictate strategy. Um, interestingly enough, if you're looking at a new website, and we give this guidance to clients quite frequently, you don't wanna necessarily get feedback from your new website from your internal team or your spouse or your you know, family or your friends. And a lot of people make this mistake. Like we, we, they don't make it with us because we give them specific directions. But if they've gotten a new website done, they might, oh, well, let me let a few people take a look at it. Oh, you know, you know, John, you're in marketing. You take a look at this. What do you think, right? And that's actually a pretty big mistake. Honestly, we don't really care what even the internal people think about the website. We really only care what the prospects think about the website or what the customers think about the website. And we're not looking for just general, what do you think about it? We're looking for very specific feedback. Would you click on this website? Does the story this website tell, does the story this website tells you, does it appeal to you in a way that makes you want to look around a little more, click more, learn more, understand a little bit more about this company. It's a very simple question. I'm not asking if you like the colors. I'm not asking if you like the picture. I'm not asking if you like the design. I'm just asking, would you be moved to act? And that is what we're trying to get people to do when they land on your website. We don't want them to just look. We want them to take action. So again, is your strategy working? Ask people to look at your web, ask prospects to look at your website, ask customers to look at your website and ask them a very specific question. Would you take action if you didn't know us? Does our website speak to you? Would you wanna click and learn a little bit more about what we do? If they're not saying yes, and emphatically saying yes, then your strategy might need some adjustments. Eric, anything you wanna add? No, that's really good. I mean, half the time I always encourage people, let's stand in the shoes of the prospect and view your company that way. It's very difficult for companies to do what Eric just said very difficult to stand in the shoes of your prospects, especially when you've been doing it for a long period of time. You're, you don't have the same lens that your prospects do. You know your business intimately. You know what you do. You know how you do it. You think it's amazing, and it probably is amazing, but your prospects are looking at it from a completely different perspective. They're skeptical. They don't believe you. It's going to take them a while to know, like, and trust you, which are the three elements that you need in place for people to want to do business with you, your website and your sales process, your people carry a big burden associated with that. So we got a couple minutes left. There are no questions. Happy to answer any questions in the last 10 minutes we have, if anybody has anything. Um, go ahead, Eric. I was just going to say, you know, we didn't touch upon technology as a strategy, and I think that's pretty important. And maybe in the last few minutes, we can just touch upon that. You know, nobody goes into their accountant's office at the end of the year with a shoebox full of paper receipts that says, here, do my taxes, right? The account smacks you on the side of the head and says, get some QuickBooks for 99 bucks a month and let's organize this. In the same vein, that's why you need some kind of technology in today's sales and marketing. And I'm not telling you go out and spend thousands of dollars and, and, and buy all sorts of stuff, but you need some kind of technology backbone to drive the kind of marketing that people need today. And it's not because Mike and I say so, it's because that's how people buy. They're on your website, they're clicking around, they're downloading things, you need tools to help you facilitate that. And make sure that you have the insights into what's working and what's not. So by investing in a piece of technology, I think that that's something strategically that CEOs should consider. Tools like HubSpot, which if you don't know us, you'll know now that's our favorite because we're one of HubSpot's largest agency partners. That starts at 300 bucks a month for the basic package. So, you know, to dip your toe in the water, get a good CRM to organize your sales folks, to get a good automation tool that'll trigger nurtures and have a backend database. It'll give you tasks and emails of the things that are necessary and day-to-day -day business communication is key. So I think if the topic of today's first session is strategy, you have to have a little bit of technology strategy as well to pick the right tool and then use it to really get the um, kind of uh, results that you're looking for. Does that make sense, Mike? Makes complete sense. Awesome. So thanks so much for watching. Thanks so much for listening. Eric and I are going to be here every Wednesday at four o'clock doing the What's Wrong with Revenue show. Uh, next week, we're going to be digging into a 
pretty big problem that we touched on a little bit today. We're going to go spend an entire uh, show talking about it. When there is no alignment between marketing sales and customer service, what can you do? So how do you get your internal departments to understand this is an experience? How do you create this seamless and remarkable prospect journey all the way across it? What to do when there are leakages that are pulling down revenue in the departments? We're going to talk about service level agreements, shared goals, revenue teams, uh, the, the chief revenue officer and how that brings marketing and sales and service together and what the specific revenue numbers look like when you uh, have a fully aligned group around revenue. You'll be able to get a, um, uh, uh, a copy of the show. You'll be able to get a link to the show. Uh, after we're done, we're going to post the show on our YouTube channel, What's Wrong With Revenue. We're going to post the show to podcast platforms near you, any of your favorite podcast platforms to be able to get the show. And you'll also be able to get it on the Square2 Marketing website. I really appreciate everybody attending. Um, and again, we'll be back here next Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern. Thank you so much and have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Eric. Bye-bye.